The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you by Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years. Close your eyes and pull like down. <laughs> and a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam McGuire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Dylan Mangan of the Southern Star and I'm joined by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. Before we get into things, I'd like to just give our listeners a gentle reminder to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you in association with our friends at Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, where your bank really does matter. Choose Credit Union, choose local choose community. Now later on we'll be hearing from Holly O'Sullivan and Dermot Duggan as they preview Cork's opening game against Clare this weekend but we want to start today with some new record breakers and history makers in West Cork. Dunman May Town's women's team picked up their first ever West Cork League women's seven title following a 1-0 victory against Inter Kenmare in Bantry at the weekend. Claire McSweeney got the winning goal there, and it's great achievement for Don Manway Kieran, who have had a long, or sorry, who have long had a strong men's team, but now offer women in the area something as well. Good things come to those who wait, Dylan, and for the the men with women. It was their 15th season competing in the the West Cork League Women's um, the Women's League, and they finally got their hands on the league title. So huge congratulations to them. Uh, like you said there, they beat into Kinmayer. It was a winner take all top of the table clash last weekend. Claire McSweeney got the goal that mattered. The men went one one nil, and they've got their hands on the trophy. It's just a great. It's it, it's a it's a it's a great local story and a great story for for the men with town for 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 the for the club for for this team to finally like I say get their hands on the on the league title. But they're not finished yet. We have the West Cork League Women's Cup final coming up this weekend, and again it's the men with town against. Uh, Inter Kinmayer. So the two teams that were fighting it out for the league title will be fighting it out for the for the cup crown as well this Sunday. So the men may will want to to cap off a dream season with a dream double. And in terms of Southern Star, I've caught up with Claire McSweeney, the the goal scoring hero from 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 last weekend. Like I was saying, her surely there'll be a statue for her put in the men we know after this because such is the magnitude of of this event and um for the. For, for the women's football team and done many, but it's it's just like I said, it's a, it's a great local story, and it, and what's nice too is that all their hard work has paid off. Like they've gone out every Sunday for however many months of the year, and they've now got their hands on the title that they wanted. Um, so yeah, so can huge congrats to Menway, but they're not finished just yet, Dylan. Yeah, and something, a nice kind of side note there as well is that Dun Manway are sponsored by a company called D-Way Constructions, I just noticed over the weekend, which is an Australian company who are actually run by a former Dun Manway town player, Alan Sheehan. So it just kind of goes to show the sense of community in the club, which can only be a good thing for them going forward. You have former players kind of supporting current teams. So that's kind of what it, what local sport is all about, in a sense. Um and then from one set of history makers, moving on to another, last time on the podcast, Kieran, we spoke about the success of Skibbereen RFC's women's team, who made it through to an All-Ireland semi-final with a brilliant victory against Westport. It was they ran in 10 tries to set up that semi-final away to Tullamore. Unfortunately, Kieran, for them, that's where their cup journey ended. Yeah, it was always going to be a tricky tie for Skibbereen. They went away to Tullamore and the game was moved to Mullen Garden last Sunday and um I was talking to Avril Candel, the Skibreen captain, on Monday just to to get reaction to the to the game, and she was telling me like the the the, the women's rugby setup in Leinster compared to Munster, it's it's like chalk and cheese as far as she knows. There there's five different divisions in Leinster, and the division Tullamore are in. I think there's seven or eight teams in that, so they're after fourteen league games or so in, in Leinster. Whereas Skibreen, they've had I think it's eight walkovers or eight concessions. Um, they've had games where the opposition can field enough players, so there's uncontested scrum. So it's been far from ideal for Skibbereen this year, but they still got to the All Ireland um, Women's Junior Cup 
semi-final. Okay, they didn't win, but they put in a really, really good performance and they really did push Tullamore. I think it was a 29-13, could have been the, the, the final score. And anyone who's on, on, on YouTube, um, there's a video doing the rounds of the Skibbereen um, Troy in the second half. Brilliant solo effort from the Skibbereen fullback. Really, really, um, really top-class piece of skill there. But it's so worth, so important to remember, this is just Skibbereen's second full playing season. And they've achieved so much already in, in those two years. Last year, and we talked about it before, they, they won all before and after them. Um, they won a, a hat-trick of Munster trophies. This year, they, they've stepped up, and and it has been tougher because they're playing playing better teams. But what, what hasn't helped them is the fact that they're, like we said, they're the concessions, the uncontested scrums, the opposition can't field. Um, but they've still, there's been progress this year. And I think what last weekend showed them was the level that they need to aspire to, to reach if they want to keep progressing and developing. And you can see from talking to someone like Avril, this Skibreen story is far from finished. Like they just want to push forward. Like they want to get better. And hopefully we'll see them back in the All Ireland Women's Junior Cup next year. Um, and they can push on again because Tullamore were the best team that Skibreen have ever faced. And they went toe to toe with them for, for a long while before Tullamore got over the line. They got the scores that matter. But there's so many positives that Skibreen can take and they're not finished yet. They have the Munster women's um the, the, the league final is on. I think it's April 16th. They're playing UL Bowes second team uh, away from home. It's going to be a, a tough game. But if Skibreen can replicate the form that they showed last Sunday against Tullamore, they're certainly with a chance. Yeah, and like you said, it's only their, their second year. So it is it is amazing um, the success that they've had. And we'll make sure to to provide a link to that try that you mentioned. We'll put it in the YouTube description, in the description of the podcast as well, if anybody does want to have a look at that. Um, just going back to soccer for a moment now, um, West Cork Academy have named the squad for this summer's Kennedy Cup, which will take place in UL. Last year saw some great success for the team in the competition where they finished 11th overall and they'll be hoping to give a good account of themselves this year again, Kieran. even though they have been drawn in a difficult opening group. Yeah, it's quite a tough group that West Cork are in with. They'll, they'll face the top seeds and, and last year's Kennedy Cup runners up Waterford. They're also in with the Limerick District and also with the North uh, Eastern Counties. So it's going to be a tough opening for or West Cork, but would like the the class of twenty twenty two proved that the the players from West Cork are good enough to hold it with, with the best in in the in the country. So how the Kennedy Cup will work will um work like it always does. West Cork will be in their group, and depending on where they finish after their group games, that will decide what's the next part of the competition they'll go on to. Is it the cup, the shield, the the, the bowl, or or the plate? So. In terms of Southern Star, we have the full squad. Um, the, the team has been named and it's made up of players from Drina Rangers, Artfield, Clannock, Kilty, AFC, Domenway Town, Kilgavin Celtic, Larry Rovers and one Kasselak. So anyone listening to this podcast and they want to see who made the cut, who made the 2023 Kennedy Cup squad, you can check out Thursday's Southern Star. And, and it's always a great indication of where a player is because we've had so many top class players come through the ranks in the West Cork Kennedy Cup team over the years, even off the top of my head now, I'm thinking of John O'Donovan. He's with um with, with Cork City now. Um he's from from Artfield. Oh, he played play, play, played with Artfield, sorry, yeah, and he's from Artfield. But he's the current FAI Schools International Player of the Year after a terrific season last year. And he's someone who learned his trade in, in the West Cork School Boys and School Girls League, played in the Kennedy Cup, and look at him now. So it's always interesting to see. In, in a couple of years' time, Dylan, we might be talking to one of the class of 2023 about joining Man United, like kind of hitting that height in a, in a, in a, in a couple of years' time. So, um, like I said, check out Torres Southern Star for the full squad. Yeah, it's a great a great story. And another small uh, note that is nice to, to see there as well is that Emma Hurley has become the first schoolgirl to re- represent West Cork at the tournament, or she will this summer. So that's a, a nice little note. Maybe it'll be Man United women's team that somebody will be signing for out of that squad in the future. Now, we're going to take a very quick break just before we come back. We'll be chatting about Cork versus Clare this weekend. The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you by Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years.
Welcome back to the Star Sport podcast. In just a few minutes, we'll be hearing from Holly O'Sullivan and Dermot Duggan ahead of Cork's Munster Senior Football Championship quarterfinal this weekend. They're playing Clare on Easter Sunday at 2 p.m. in Cusack Park. But before we get to that, Kieran, I just wanted to get your thoughts on Cork's league season now that it has finished and wrapped up. Uh, we, we missed last week after the, the loss to Derry. And I just wanted to get your kind of final thoughts on what, what kind of was a mixed bag in the end for, for Cork. That's exactly the description I'd reach for. It was a mixed bag, Dylan. So Cork finished fourth in Division 2. Three wins, three defeats in that draw against Derry on the last day. So there was a lot of good in there. There was a couple of, couple of negatives too. There was a lot of work to do. Um, but I think it's important to note this is a Cork team that's very much a work in progress. Um, maybe it was expecting, well, I was expecting too much to, to think that, that Cork could challenge the likes of Dublin and Derry this early in, in their development and in the John Cleary um, era. So I think they'll be pretty happy with where they with where they finished. Um, it was a top half top half finish in Division 2. They weren't involved in the relegation scrap, which is a definite plus. Um, with two rounds to go, Cork were still in the promotion conversation. So that shows you, even from last year, when Cork needed to win in the final day to avoid relegation to Division 3, that's progress right there in the league um, alone. I think they look back at the, the league with some regrets. That first game against Mead, um, that was one of Cork's poorer performances. They lost that home game and it put them on, on the on the back foot after that. They were playing um they were playing catch up after that, to be honest. Look at the the loss to Dublin. That was a really good Cork performance, but they still lost that game, the low game away from home. They'll have regrets about that too, losing losing that day to to a resurgent load, but albeit still a low team that you'd expect Cork to 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 beat. So um I think Cork will come out of it pretty happy because they know that they've made progress, but they know they can identify pretty fast two areas that they need to do better in. Like they need to, even though Cork had an awful lot of goals during the league, they still left an awful lot of chances behind them. Um, so they, they know they need to be a bit more clinical, more rootless in, in front of goal. But I think we've now finished the league with a, a very consistent Cork, um, Cork team selection. It's like we can straight away now before the team is named later this week for Sunday's game, you can probably get 12 or 13 of the players who'll start. I know there was injury concerns about Brian Hurley and Mar Shanley. Um and hopefully the two lads will be fit to fit to take their their, their place in, in the Cork team. But I think Cork are in a, a good place going into the going into the championship. And like we'll hear from Dear McDougan and, and Hawley uh, quite soon. There's a possibility of another seven games in the championship here if Cork can get to the Munster final. And then there's obviously the new Sam Maguire format, group stage format later, later this championship too, which will guarantee three group games. So this could be a, a really um, a really important time in this Cork team's development because if they get another seven games off the back of their seven games in the league, off the back of the three McGrath Cup, that could be 17 games in, in an inter-county season. And for a new team like Cork, who are still finding their feet and still getting to... to, to, to to know each other and to know what works and to know what doesn't work. I think that could be uh, quite important. And hopefully the the good West Cork air last weekend will have served them well, Dylan, there. And the Cork team was down in West Cork last weekend for a mini training camp. They, they stayed in the Celtic Ross Hotel in Ross Garbury and they were they were really well looked after there. And um, from all accounts, it was a really good weekend for the Cork footballers as they were putting the, the final touches on their preparations ahead of, of Sunday. But it's an important to know too. It's going to be tricky, tricky way to clear on Sunday. Yeah, and just before we we jump to that chat, um, at the midway point of the league campaign, I think you gave Cork a B plus on their scorecard. What would you give them now? Oh, um, I'd actually probably a B minus. I think because oh, that's a that's a tough one. Yeah, because. Like they obviously didn't get promoted, but they were in that promotion conversation for a bit. And I think why I take marks off them is because they went away to load in a game that they needed to win. Um, well, sorry, actually, because they knew going into that game that there was different results that they couldn't get promoted, but there was still they needed to go away to a team like Loud and and beat them. I I think that that would have been quite important because for this Cork team, 
and I keep saying like it, it is a new Cork team. It's all about progression and development. So let's take this Sunday for example. Okay, they beat Clare and Cusick Park in in in, this in the league last month. But now this is the championship. It's a different animal. So the next challenge and step for this Clare for this Cork team is to beat Clare away from home in the championship game. That's why I would like to see Cork beat Loud away from home in a, in a, against a a low team that were coming off the back of three wins in a row. It was just a, a game where Cork came up short, but it's also a game where Cork can identify straight away reasons why they lost that game. They didn't take their goal chances. They con- conceded a penalty. Daniel O'Mahony got a red card. So straight away you can say, okay, these are reasons why Cork didn't win. But I still think B- minus is a it's just a good solid mark for this Cork team because they're not where, where they want to be. But we've definitely seen progress. And what we'd like to see in the next couple of weeks is more progress because this championship is going to run off pretty fast. Cork are playing Clare on Sunday. If Cork get over that hurdle, they have Limerick two weeks after that. Get past Limerick. We're looking at all probability amongst the final against Kerry down in Clarny. I think it's May 7th. And that's that's not too far away. That's only only four or five weeks away. So, um. There's a yeah, an, an, an exciting couple of weeks, and like I say, hopefully we'll just keep seeing this Cork football story just pushing forward, and we'll just see them kick on a small bit, and um, could be an exciting summer. Yeah, an exciting couple of weeks, an exciting summer, and an exciting weekend ahead. So let's hear now from Holly O'Sullivan and Dermot Duggan on this weekend's fixture. Just a couple of days out now before Cork take on Clare in the Munster opener. So I'm going to go to you first, Holly. Are we more optimistic now with where this Cork team are, having seen what we saw in those seven games in Division Two of the league? Um, I would think so, but there, there, there was there was there was probably room for a lot more optimism, if you know what I mean. Um, like the the, the Mead game was definitely one that was let slip, and with all the goal chances they had against Lowe, regardless of what kind of a game, because you could easily have come out of that as well. And it could have come down to the the last game against Derry, but look, you 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 were safe. You know, you're, you're you're avoiding being involved in a relegation battle for the first time in a few years. And um, like regardless of what happens in Munster, they've secured their spot in the in the four by four for, for Sam Maguire. So look, you said there were seven games in the league. <clears throat> there's a possibility I was looking at a while ago, there's a possibility of seven more. You know, you could have three in Munster, then you look three in the four by four, and like three teams go to that. So you could have a possibility of a preliminary quarter or a quarter. Depending on depending on how it wins, so that's that could be seven championship games, which would be huge for this group. What's your assessment, dear of where this Cork team stands out? Like we said, seven games in the league. Cork finished fourth, won three, lost three, drew one. A couple of games there that almost Cork could have won. Like Holly mentioned, there loud that game against Dublin and taking up a Parky Creeve straight away. Brian Hurley was the the width of a crossbar. What a, a fingertip save by the Dublin keeper. In that opening game against Mead, which was probably one of Cork's more disappointing performances. So, what's your assessment of, of where Cork are now with the league behind them? I think it's a uh, Holly summed it up pretty well there. I think. Um, I think John Cleary, when he was asked about it, considered it a, a mixed bag some good stuff, some poor stuff, and some okay stuff, you know. So, I think that's probably a pretty good summation of it. Um, as Holly said, they started off with a lot of optimism at the beginning of the year, but you know, it fell very flat then with, with a poor performance. In the second half against Meath, then they upped it considerably. You know, they away to Kildare to come out with a fabulous uh, uh, victory, and then they, they had a goal fest against Limerick, and obviously, as you mentioned, came very close uh, to beating Dublin as well. So, like around that time, there was a huge optimism even among supporters that this Cork team are back, um, and that you know we're going to be competing at the top table. But it was never going to be like that, really. Um, and I think. The league position probably doesn't lie. You know, we finished fourth out of eight teams, but uh, possibly we could have finished third. You know, there's nothing between Loud and ourselves, I think. So I think overall, it's probably about right because, you know, most people um, looking in from the outside would have said Dublin and Derry were always going to finish number one and two. We were very close to finishing third. So it's probably about right. And I think it is progress, uh, maybe not as much as we would have thought or liked. Um, but it's definitely progress. Holly mentioned there we were in a relegation battle the last number of years. So we were comfortably avoiding that this year. Plus, we had an opportunity with one game to go off of possibly um, reaching a final as well. So I think on the whole, it's it's progress, not a huge progress, but it is progress and we're going in the right direction. Just on that progress, Holly, the fact that there's no one almost a consistency to the Cork selection, it's kind of fit into a consistency of performance. Okay, the results are kind of up and down, like we said, one three and last three in the league, as well as that draw. But 
there's definitely a consistency in the team selection that we haven't seen in, in the last couple of years. And even though we could probably know 10, 11, 12 of the starting 15 against Clare on, on Sunday, how much has that helped John Cleary? First off, touch wood that the injury injury list the last couple of years has definitely shortened. But to have that consistency in team selection, it's um it gives us a better idea of where this Cork team are. Yeah, and I suppose consistency in the team selection leads to the management being able to work consistently on their game plan and how they want to play. And it has built competition within the squad. And we've seen, you know, we've seen guys coming off the bench and make a big difference, like Mark Cronin and, and Connor Carpet uh, last last weekend or the weekend of the day again. Um, I think on top of that, like if you look at the back line, <clears throat> you have three backs that weren't even there last year. Luke Fahey and Tommy Walsh and, and Dan Lomani. And they're, they're, they're out to bring huge physicality and, and power and strength and ability to that back line. And it's the same in the forward line. Now, you didn't have Chris Old Jones or Rory Dean or Brian O'Driscoll last year. So you have six there straight away and try and shine me. And on top of that, who doesn't look like he's going to make it based on, on the teams that have been picked for the league. So, like, you, 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 you have a different, you know, kind of type of player more consistently across the whole pitch. There's way more physicality to the team and way more strength, particularly in the back line. Just on the players mentioned there, Holly, or even look at, it, at the Cork team during the league, what players impressed you the most? Well, Daniel O'Mahony has been fantastic at fullback. I know he got the, the red card um, against, who was it again? Against loud. Way, way to load, right? He got the red card that day, but before that, he's been... Very, very dynamic at fullback. Tommy Walsh is a huge bonus in the corner because he can mark a bigger man. He's a big man himself. And Luke Fahey wasn't in the picture at all at all last year. And all of a sudden, he's he's a shoe in now to be playing either five or seven for um for the championship. And look, as I said, like R- Rory Dean, I thought for the last quarter of an hour against Derry, when Rory Dean went into the inside forward line, he kind of set the standard. He started harassing and chasing and winning hard ball. And he got the touch for the goal that Maguire scored at the end. You know, so like he's brought a huge amount as well, amount because he's a he's a big straight line runner, very like Brian O'Driscoll as well. And the way Cork are playing, and the way every team are playing, you know, where you only where you want him one or two up, and when you get the turnover, you've got to go hard, and you've got the fellas that can that can break the line. You know, all these guys have been a huge bonus. Just on that consistency team selection, Dermot, does that mean now we have a better idea of the identity of what this Cork team is about? Because we know. Like we said there, John Clear, we know 10, 11, 12 of the players he's going to pick against Clare, but we have a better idea of what a Cork football team are going to do now compared to the last couple of years where from one game to, to the next, we just weren't sure what was going to happen, who was going to be selected, who was going to be picked. But there's no, that, like, that consistency is helping this Cork team find their feet. It is definitely because, look, they have an identity now and... Um, that, that always helps, you know, and it just gives the players themselves confidence when they go out, you know, they have a system to play um, to play with. And um, even against Dublin, you know, they mix up their systems incredibly well. At times they went very, very long um, and other times they worked it short, you know, and um, they're working on playing different ways now as well, which helps. Now, it hasn't always been brilliant and at times they were still going maybe too laterally and they weren't willing to break the line, but there's still a massive... Um, improvement considering where they were a number of years ago when there was just no real um there was no real plan almost you know and you couldn't really see a, an obvious plan anyway so it definitely is um improving and obviously they're you know they're, they're probably more defensively solid now as well they're getting numbers back some wing forwards back and helping out in defense and that so um ob- like in the way the modern game is played and how you you can't really play ad hoc anymore you have to have have a, a defined system of playing and a uh, practice and rehearse it over and over again until it becomes automatic and um, they're definitely getting there they're improving and um, Holly mentioned that potentially at the start we could have seven championship games at least seven championship games all going well um, and that's going to be an opportunity to embed those systems even more again. I think one of the most pleasing aspects of Cork's form in the league is scored 10 goals top scorers in division two total of 137 points combined and even though Cork scored 10 goals we can still list off now or remember chances, goal chances that, that, that Cork missed during the league. So it shows hardly that there's there's an edge to this to this Cork attack now that we hadn't seen in, in a couple of years. Yeah, and in fairness, though, the like the, the, the inside fellas that have been playing, like you, you had Hurley and, and, and Sherlock and, and Chris Og Jones, you know, they, they, they've been doing a lot of the scoring and Potter came up, I think he has four goals 
Um, out of, out of, uh, was it 10 or 14? It had a 14.95 dead in total in the league, no? Is it 14? Oh, you could be right, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. But, like, the, I, I think of those 14, I was only reading somewhere the other day, there were, there were eight different goal scorers out of the 14 goals. And, like you said, I think there were six goal chances against, six one-on-one one guilty chances against Loud that, they, that would have got them over the line if they got any one of them. But they've obviously made a conscious decision that when the chance is there and they feel the overlap is there, that they're going for goal. And look, goals win games. And when you're playing the likes of Kerry and, and Dublin and maybe a few more of the better teams later on in the time, you know, you're going to have to get goals to beat them. And Dougie mentioned there a while ago as well, you know, the fact that we are not willing to kick the ball when, when it's on. You know, it didn't happen in every game, but it happened far more often than it had been happening. And that speeds up your game an awful lot. <clears throat> We're heading into the championship now. Cork away to, to Clare Cusick Park on Sunday, two o'clock, the start of the, of the championship. The fact that Cork have won there already in the league, uh, dear mother, a couple couple of weeks back, and the fact the fact that they beat Clare as well in the in the McGrath Cup earlier in the year. How do you think? For, for does this leave this Cork team going into a game? Because it's still a very tricky game on paper. I know Clare were relegated, and Cork, like I said, they beat them in Ennis a couple of weeks ago. But this is this is championship. Like this will be a different animal to what we saw in in the league a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I will. And I think Clare are definitely a team that Cork won't take for granted because, you know, they've struggled to beat them over the last number of years, you know, either losing to them or struggling to beat them. So I think it's one they will be very tuned in for. And um, I suppose the only thing in Cork's favour is Clare, after a number of very, very positive years for Clare where they progressed and, and have been making progress, they're at a, type of, uh, at a source of a crossroads now themselves, you know. Um, performances haven't been great. They've shipped a couple of heavy defeats to Derry, was one of them anyway. And I suppose they'll see this as a make-or-break game for them as well. You know, they, if they beat Cork, it could push on their season. But if they lose to Cork, they probably consider it a very, very poor year, you know. So it's definitely a game that Cork shouldn't take for granted. But given the performance of both teams in the last number of weeks, I couldn't see anything other than a Cork victory and anything less than a Cork victory would be a massive, massive disappointment as well. You know, um, if Cork are serious about the progression and to keep this momentum going, they have to be looking to beat Clare, or even if it is up in Ennis, you know. So I think they will beat them. Would you be as confident how I did that? I there as well, Kim. Um, like, obviously, W is right there that Cork has to be very careful. We have to remember back as well, like, this Clare team were six points up on Dublin with a quarter hour to go off. I remember right in the league. And there were five points up and killed there with 10 minutes to go and they ended up losing both games. But like that gives you an idea of well uh, as well of the you know the, the quality that they possess to get in, get themselves into those positions. So look, it is it is going to be one that they're gonna to have to be seriously tuned in for. Would you be as confident, Holly, as, as dear Mid that the Cork will get the job done on Sunday? I think Cork will be clear and they'll beat Limerick and we'll have a right rattle right off the off carry in the in the Monster final game. It's a, that's a confident pr- prediction at the, at the start of April. But, but just on, on that as well, Holly, for this Cork team, and we keep talking about their development and progression, like for them to go in out to Clare on Sunday and get a result, like that, that's, a, that's an important part of their growth and development, that they can go away to a tough, tricky venue like this and get a result. Yeah, but I, I, I think also one, one thing we haven't mentioned, and I'd only be talking to Dennis Max Sweeney here, Ross was involved with, the, he's the, one of the kit men for the Cork seniors. And I, I, th- I think the spirit in the squad is, is absolutely huge this year. There's a great camaraderie and a great atmosphere around the whole thing. So I think going away to games like that, they won't be carrying doubt, if you know what I mean. And, and doubt and anxiety are two things that can lead to fellas tightening up and not performing the way they should. You know, I, I, th- I think they're a tight group. And I think, you know, there, there, there is fighting and, and there is a willingness to battle there. And that will all be needed in in Innes, where you'll have a big home support as well. And it's going to be... It's going, they, they'll be in on top of you all around the pitch and they'll be doing their best to intimidate Cork and they'll show an off here at Cork early. You know, so, like, obviously a start is going to be key. You know, if, if Cork do get a start up there, it's going to be it's going to be very important. It could get them over the line. Yeah, when we talk about the league and championship, like two very different animals, but the fact that the two competitions are so close together now with the with the, with the GA season, the way, the way it is, the league finishes and you're straight into championship. There's very little of a buffer in between. So does that mean that the league form now was more important than ever before? Like we have a Cork team, confident mid-table finish, going up against a clear team who've been relegated. So will, will, will what happened in the league have an impact on what happens on Sunday? 
Yeah, I think I think it, it will have an impact, but I, I don't think you'd want to overstate that either. Um, I mean, you look at some of the teams in the league, even Dublin themselves, you know, performed very, very poorly in, in some of their games in the league. You know, I know they got victories in most of them, but they still didn't perform that well. And yet they put on a five-star performance in against Derry in the final. So, you know, it's it's back to that old cliche again, you're only as good as your last performance. And, and I think... You know, even similar to Cork, they had a poor performance in Mead, uh, against Mead early on and suddenly they turned around and there was huge optimism. But certainly if you were going poorly in the league, I think it's very, very hard because you don't have an opportunity to play challenge games and build up your confidence and things like that. If you're going poorly in the league, it is very hard to, to just, you know, switch it on and suddenly become uh, world beaters in the championship. But um, I think it, it, it definitely does have a bearing that they're they're so close together, but you know, I still wouldn't overstate it either. Paulie, who given what we've seen so far from Cork McGrath Cup, three games there, seven games in the league, who are Cork's most important players? Who will be the fellas that they look to know over the next couple of weeks to, to try and get them to Munster final and to try and get them to kick on? Well, I suppose the, the, the most standout player across all the games for me has been Cormac Callan. You know, he, he looks he definitely looks about a half a stone lighter and leaner and fitter than he did last year. Um, he's winning, you know, independent ball around the middle from from kickouts consistently. You know, he's he's probably been performing more consistently and at a higher level than Maguire. Even and Maguire has carried Cork for years, so like it's 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 a huge it's a huge one that they found the partner for Maguire that can. You know, pick up the slack when Maguire might be at absolutely 100% or if the opposition of a very good midfielder is keeping Maguire out of the game. Um, obviously, you know, you're not going to win low scores on the board. You know, like Brian Hurley has been very, very dangerous inside. You know, he's he was missed against Derry because if, if he gets any sniff of a one and one on the edge of the square, he's going to look to take on his man and bury it. You know, others mightn't have that same cutting edge as he has. You know, Sherlock would rather kick a point unless... He, he won't got to take on his men as, as aggressively as Hurley will. Um, you know, Rory Dean has been very good since he got in. Daniel O'Mahony, as I mentioned before, full back. Rory McGuire has been performing very consistently at centre back. You know, that's your that's your middle line down the middle, and that's what you're you're basing your whole team on, basically. You know, so like they're they're building, and it, you know, I I would I would be positive and and we we are in a far, far better place than we've been in the last couple of years. Same question to you, Dermot. What car players or player do you think that we can hang a lot of hope off over the next couple of weeks? Well, I think I think Chris jo- Chris Old Jones has been um, quite good. You know, um, he's been very very you know industrious, uh, working hard off the ball and showing for the ball. Uh, probably an area that he needs to work on is his finishing. And um, there were a number of opportunities, you know, where he is in a goal and, and doesn't finish. But um, I think John Cleary said that's something they're they're putting a lot of work into at the moment is goal scoring finishing. Um, Luke Fahey as well as we Holly mentioned earlier has been quite good and um, he's he's seems like he's nailed down a place. But you know I, I'd like to see him even push on even further. And you know when you look at the best wing backs in the game, you could think of maybe um, Jarlett Oak Burns, you know, with Arma or Paddy Durkin with Mayo. You know, these guys are probably the template of what a, a, a superb wing back is. And there's no reason I think why Luke can't even push on his game even further. Um, I think back to. Um, I think it was at 06 when George Spillane came on the scene first as a centre back. George just like was absolutely outstanding and he ended up winning an all star in his debut season. So I think, you know, these guys, and I think John should be, in, and I, I presume he is, you know, but encouraging these, like they, there's no limit to their ceiling in, in terms of what they can do. And um, so I'd like, I'd like to see, even though they have been good, Chris Old Jones would say, and, and Luke Fay and, and those, I'd like them to see them push it to the next level and just take the game by the scruff of the neck and just really push Cork into that competitive um, stage of what they can, uh, of the championship and see what they can do then. There's no point asking your predictions for Sunday because you've both given them, given them already, but I want to ask your predictions for the championship as a whole. Will this be the year that Mayo finally in their long ways are Kerry good enough to defend their title? Have, have the dubs another kick in them? Can we expo- expect something off Derry, Galway? What are you expecting from the championship? What teams do we think will be in contention for Sam? Well, there's certainly more than there used to be, let's say, three or four years ago when Dublin were dominating. Um, like in Munster, Kerry are definitely there again. You have Mayo and Galway, um, <clears throat> Dublin, probably Tyrone and Derry. Outside of that, I can't see a winner from any, any of the others. No, outside those five or six. And if I was to pick one, not the way Dublin are going at the moment, they seem to be building, they're going to be very hard to beat. 
Yeah, I, I'd probably agree. I'd, I'd nearly say Dublin as well. Um, looking at them there now in the league final and then add in, um, oh, what's his name, the wing back? Um, Jack McCaffrey. Jack McCaffrey into, you know, Mannion in corner forward and he's back fully. Um, you know, Brian Howard, if he comes back into it as well. I just think that they have another gear in them and I think they'll be very, very close. That, um, I think Mayo will be there, thereabouts. Whether they'll win or not is another question. And I think probably Kerry, we can't discount Kerry either. Obviously, they're kind of they're going under the radar at the moment. But you know, any team with, with Sean O'Shea and Clifford, like they're they're going to be there, thereabouts anyway for sure. A lot of football to be played over the next couple of weeks and months. I suppose it starts off for Cork this Sunday in his two o'clock against Clare. So hopefully, that's we'll have a catch up in a couple of weeks' time. We'll be looking forward to a Munster final in Killarney and ending. Cork's poor record in Fitzgerald Stadium. So till then, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you by Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast. We're going to take a look now at what's coming up in this week's sports section, Kieran, which is packed as always. Yeah, we'll have some of the stories that we mentioned earlier, the likes of the Benway Town winning the West Cork League Women's Sevens title, Skibreen bowing out of the All-Ireland Cup. But on top of that, and tying in with our, our Cork and Clare preview, I'm recapping the 1997 Munster Senior Football Semi-Final which was also Cork and Clare up in Cusick Park. But it's not a, a game Cork fans will remember too fondly. That's the day that Martin Daly got a, an injury time goal for Clare and they knocked Larry Tompkins Cork out of the championship that year. That was an era before back doors and, and second chances and scenic routes. So I caught up with Cork manager Larry Tompkins and also Fox de Collins and mm-hmm. um, the Island Rovers footballer who played for Cork that day just to get their memories and recollections of just a, a bad day at the office for the Cork footballers. But there's there's a warning in that too. Cork went into that game as favourites and they were caught by a, by a late soccer punch. So just for the, the class of 2023, even though the, I think the gap between Cork and Clare is obviously a lot closer now than it, than it was back then. It's just that you have to take your chances. So that's well well worth to read. We also have re- um, action from the, the latest round of the County Hurling League and the uh, Badlandscarty Hurlers made their this, this, this Division 7 debut and they were far too strong for Valley Rovers. So we have a report and reaction from that. We also have all the, the local soccer, basketball, road bowling news. So there's more sports. So there, there's a lot going on in this Thursday Southern Star. Well worth checking as always. Yeah, absolutely. All that will be available in shops across West Cork from Thursday morning. As always, if you're further afield or you can't make it to the shops, you can subscribe to the Southern Star e-paper and get the Southern Star on your laptop, tablet or mobile phone. Just head to subscribe.southernstar.ie, enter your details and you get an exact replica of the newspaper for less than two euro per week. And I'll just quickly plug last week's O'Donovan Ross special. We didn't have the podcast last week. So anyone who um, is an O'Donovan Rasa fan or just a local football fan and um, there's some great um, eight pages of material there on the 30th anniversary of their All-Ireland Club senior winning team. As always, thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast and thanks again to our sponsors Ac- Access Credit Union. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts and we'll talk to you soon.